Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started in the interest of time. Happy Friday. Thank you everyone for joining today from near and far to share part of your Friday afternoon or morning um, with me for this installment of Annenberg's Conversations on Gender. Today, exploring how gender and popular culture collide in music and sport. I know I have learned so much from previous iterations of this series, um, have been inspired by those conversations, and I look forward to contributing to that dialogue, that important dialogue today with my guest, who I will introduce momentarily. Before we begin, I want to start by acknowledging that I am on Lenape land, president, uh, present day Philadelphia. Um, I'm grateful to be joining from this space and a guest in this space. For those who I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Perry Johnson, and I am a postdoctoral fellow here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I first want to express my thanks, Barbie Zelitzer, professor and director of the Annenberg Center for Media at Risk, and to Sarah Benet Weiser, Professor and Director for the Annenberg Center for Collaborative Communication, who have both been steadfast in their support of me and my work and have provided me with a really generative intellectual and institutional home here at Penn through my joint postdoc with those two centers. I also want to extend uh, my deep gratitude to Dean Jackson for inviting me to share this space with you all today in conversation with one of my absolute favorite scholars, uh, Dr. Courtney M. Cox, someone who I am so fortunate to call a colleague, collaborator, and friend. Today, Courtney and I will join me in conversation for approximately 35 minutes, um, after which I'll open it up uh, for Q&A. So please submit questions into the Q&A function. Uh, and I look forward to moderating what I'm sure will be a robust discussion following our conversation and experience and insight that Courtney will share with us this afternoon. So Dr. Courtney M. Cox is an assistant professor in the Department of Indigenous Race and Ethnic Studies at the University of Oregon. Her research examines issues related to identity, technology, and labor within sport. Her current book project, Double Crossover, Gender, Politics, and Performance in Basketball considers how Black women and non-binary athletes maneuver through the global sports media complex. She is also co-director with me of The Sound of Victory, a multi-platform digital humanities project that, uh, that is located at the intersection of music, sound, and sport. Prior to returning to academia, Courtney worked for ESPN, for Longhorn Network, for the Los Angeles-based NPR affiliate, KPCC, and the WNBA's Los Angeles Sparks. Courtney, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a fantastic thing. It's like our, our own conversations kind of in a very public forum. I'm really excited. Yes, me too. Um, so I'd love to open up the conversation today with a little bit of background and context hearing from you about your journey into academia and how you came to this work. Yeah, so um, like many folks in academia, it's not this really linear route. There's all these different ways that we're moving through space. And so for me, um, I was a journalism major in undergrad, broadcast journalism specifically. And I really fell even into that space just by working at the local campus TV station and just realizing how much I loved making television. Um, I also worked at the radio station. I also wrote uh, for the paper, the school paper. And so I became a journalism nerd really, really early in life. And after undergrad, my first job out of college was at ESPN, which was completely unexpected for me. I thought maybe I'd do the local TV, working my way up to national route. And so for me, starting out at 20 years old, I hadn't even turned 21. I was sneaking into the happy hours for my job. Um, and so thinking about that space, I was working in event production on college football and the Heisman Trophy presentation. And there were so many questions I instantly had that were in many ways, thinking about not only mediated sport, what it means to create sport for television, all the ways that we color correct grass, we make things more vivid than they are if you're actually there. They sound different on television. Um, so I've always kind of been fascinated and interested in how we make sport visually captivating. Um, I think after moving from event production to studio directing, it became a much more technical perspective. I worked on a lot of sports center, um, a lot of countdown shows, pregame, rap 
wrap shows, those halftime shows that get you back to the action. Um, and I think that really expanded what I thought about. And there were all of these things that were very racially and gendered um, that were happening at the time. And, and these moments that happened to either me as an employee or to people around me really made me start thinking about not only the people that are creating this media, but what this tells us about who's included, who's excluded, who belongs in these spaces. And so while I was working at Longhorn Network, I had the opportunity to get a master's degree at the University of Texas at Austin. And that's when I think the, the nerdiness came back really strong of like learning about research and realizing the world that I lived in was something that other people were researching. And people thought that studying sports media was something worthy of study. And so uh, I think that's where I was like, oh, I think I know something about this. And I was decided if I didn't get a PhD, then I, I wouldn't go through the process of learning to read deeply again. And so for me, it just really brought together doing this work brings together the experience this, that I've had um, combined with what it's like to think through these broader ideas that move outside of sport. I like to think of think about the fact that I think about things like labor through sport um, rather than being just a sports scholar um, in many ways. And there are fantastic folks that do that, that are entrenched in sport. But I'm really interested in how sport tells us so much about the rest of the world. Um, what happens on and off of the pitch um, or the court or the field really tells us a lot of things about ourselves and the story that we tell about ourselves as well. Yes, yeah, so you point to this question of, of sport as an entry point, right? As an entry point in part to think about identity, as sport is an entry point to think about how systems uh, like racism, like sexism sort of map onto the entertainment sphere, the industry, uh, the landscape that we think of as sports. So as part of a series on gender, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about how identity, how identity uh, in relationship to power in particular is centered in your work through the analytic of gender. Um, I know you and I have spent countless hours thinking through how both music and sports serve as these entry points, yeah. uh, how they share, share characteristics as dominant entertainment industries, uh, and that both continue to operate as male, male dominated spaces. So I'd love for you to explore with us out loud a little bit about how you navigate this reality when it comes to identity, gender in your own work. Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that was really obvious when I, there are all these ways we know that um, there are there's a lot of gender dynamics in terms of who we see on television. If we keep it to that, that broadcast sequence, we know that uh, women's sports receive significantly less coverage than their male counterparts. We know that there are so many different ways that working within these industries, my very first piece of research was about uh, women's sports journalists and their experiences on Twitter. And this is in 2012. Right. So at that point, Twitter is a very different space. And I was wondering what it was like to need to both promote yourself on social media, but also be subjected to all of the different ways that folks are telling you how you belong in the kitchen to make them a sandwich, all of these things. And so I realized gender is always kind of marinated in my work, whether I'm thinking about who is creating sports media, thinking about the athletes that animate my work and, and that I've been honored to learn so much from. Um, there's all these different ways that gender is playing out. And, and I and I'm, don't say that just in thinking about women and non-binary athletes um, in particular, although that's what my current book project is about. It's also about how men try to solidify or there's ways that that masculinity is entrenched in sport where there's this need to buy it. I've had guy friends of mine tell me that there's this need to like watch sports so that they can converse with other men or this way that if they don't watch football or whatever it might be, there's this way they're read outside the frame of what men do. And so I'm interested in how we gender ourselves through sport in many ways, how gender is constantly um, both centered in many ways. We talk about men's sports versus women's sports. Um, this ways that 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 sex segregation in many ways is constantly reinforcing the gender binary as well. Um, and so it's kind of inescapable to think about gender in that particular way. And I think when I first spent a season with the Los Angeles Sparks back in 2015, I actually ended up leaving the field with more questions than answers. And that's kind of what started to keep me up at night. It's like, why is the WNBA structured this way? Why are we thinking about women's basketball in a way that's very different than how we think about men's basketball? How are they marketed differently? How are they pushed differently in terms of journalism? And so these questions start to really animate how I think about the world of basketball, a sport that I love. Um, but I think it's really helped me also expand out beyond just thinking about how journalism uh, has a role here, but also how athletes themselves are seeing how gender plays out in their everyday lives, what endorsements they get now that we have name image likeness at the college level, um, who's getting what kinds of endorsements and not just thinking about how that might affect women's hoops, um, but also how that's even racialized, right? Um, how we elevate certain white women athletes 
athletes, um, over black women that are in this sport that is majority black. And so I'm really, for me, gender continues to circulate, not in, only in terms of interrogating power, um, but also how we perform the self in these spaces. I think that's a, a huge part. It's not just about how discriminatory practices um, or systemic oppression happens. It's also about how we can play with gender um, through sport in really interesting, profound ways. Yeah, no, that's that's so important. Um, and it's so nice to hear you have the space to think through these because I mean, you know, gender is a social construction, sport operates as a key, key factor, key vector in that socialization process, but also is this this fluency, if you will, right, of thinking about how masculinity, how femininity is shaped through the ability to talk about, to converse about particular sports, power obviously being central to that in terms of how, how these intersections um, impact us individually and also through our social relations. Um, and I know you're thinking about this through an interdisciplinary lens, through a multi-platform lens. Uh, we were both trained as communication scholars. You are now in an indigenous race and ethnic studies department. You are someone who traverses cultural studies grounds. Um, so I'm interested in, in how you think about interdisciplinary research and multi-platform research with respect to the archive, because I know archival work is centered in much of, in much of what you do, um, and one avenue through which you, you explore these histories to sort of recover, to reclaim histories that have been overlooked, that have been intentionally uh, or symptomatically excluded, um, and in your words, the women who have sort of been, quote unquote, lost to history, right, who's been foregrounded, who's been backgrounded in these modes. Um, and, and part of this, if, if I'm representing your work correctly, is an attempt to activate the archive, right? How can we not just sort of look to histories to think about, about gaps um, or to think about narratives that should maybe be, be reimagined, revisited, but also how do you bring those to life in a present context where they are serving your work, serving your interlocutors, um, serving the sort of broader project of sports more broadly. So I'd love to hear a little bit about um, from you how these living narratives, how your work with archives, um, how you think about that uh, in relationship to your work. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a huge part. I think uh, I'm not a historian, but I do in many ways try to draw these larger connections across time and space. I don't assume that anything I'm seeing on Instagram today is something that is completely brand new that doesn't have this longer legacy. And so for me, I'm really trying to find these through lines. I'm trying to bring all of these different folks into conversation with each other because I think they're talking to each other in one way or the other. Sometimes they're very aware that that conversation is happening and sometimes they aren't. And so one of the ways that that recovery happens, I'll, I'll give one really quick example that continues to happen in my work in spaces that I operate in within sport is this idea of the athlete activist or the activist athlete. There's an interesting kind of dynamic about, about what is the noun, what is the, the adjective. But I think one of the things I always see is the common names that are invoked are men. When we're talking about race, when we're talking about gender equity in sport, they're commonly white women. And I was like, where are black women in this conversation? Um, and so one of the things that I constantly try to do is instead of thinking about when we think about gender equity, folks are going to pull out incredible people. They're going to say Billie Jean King, great example. Um, but then I'm thinking about someone like Venus Williams who fought for pay equity at Wimbledon that changed the pay structure of tennis. Um, I'm thinking about that. And so I'm constantly, whenever people are like, oh, there were no athlete activists in the nineties, or there was this lack in that moment. I'm like, well, that's only if we think about certain folks, or that's only if we think about certain categories. And so one of the folks that I bring into my work a lot of times um, that people know but don't know maybe about her activism is Cheryl Miller. She's one of my favorite basketball players of all time. Um, and so for me, thinking about her testifying in front of a, um, a Senate committee um, about Title IX, which has always been a fight, which continues to be a fight. Um, I try to think about how things like Title IX are a constant battle. They are not these things that we just celebrate, even as we come up on the 50th anniversary of Title IX this year. One of the things I think about about is along that we both erase the battle, we make it a very clean thing that wasn't constantly contested, that isn't constantly um, up for grabs, up for battle now. Um, but I think about her testifying after winning a championship 
at USC after um, winning a gold medal, um, this additional labor of going beforehand and, and fighting and saying, not only is Title IX important for me winning a championship and a gold medal, not only is it important for this nation in that way, but it's also important that me as a black woman can go into a hospital and, and, and be able to fight for equitable treatment. And so she says, I'm a black, I'm an athlete, but I'm a black woman first. And so I'm, I'm pulling from those kind of statements of um, activism, of thinking about what it means to think outside of who you are as an athlete and to these larger understandings and this relationship between sport and how we all move through society. And so I think about that. I also think about 2016 as this moment for a lot of people. Um, there's this focus on athlete activism through someone like Colin Kaepernick, former NFL player. Um, but the summer before Kaepernick's first knee in the NFL, um, we had an amazing show of activism and solidarity across women's sports, specifically in the WNBA. And so one of the things I think about is how a lot of that activism is erased or um, the timing is always switched, right? It's Kaepernick and then it's other athletes, right? And there's no way that folks are willing to consider that maybe Colin Kaepernick was inspired by the activism of WNBA players that acted in solidarity and thinking about what allyship looks like. And so we have great examples um, within the W and all other spaces and the NWSL is another great example um, of thinking about what these spaces could look like if we think about activism more broadly, if we're not always invoking these folks who are incredibly important scholar, you know, figures or scholars, um, but thinking about other ways of thinking about intellectual thought, life and activism um, through athletes that aren't talked about as much. And so for me, that's a huge part of thinking about struggle, of resistance, um, of thinking about the voices that have always been fighting. And I've also been really um, um, and really inspired by and really learned a lot through scholars that are historians like Amira Rose Davis about how to find these figures, right? And so the problem I think we often do is we wait until we lose our heroes to celebrate them. Um, and that happens so often for women who are these, um, for lack of a better word, hidden figures, right? That can then be kind of historicized in a particular way, these smoothed over histories um, that happen. And this happened recently with Lucia Harris. And Lucy Harris is a huge figure in women's hoops, but in basketball history more broadly um, across every level of basketball, um, first woman drafted into the NBA. People don't even know that that women were drafted into the NBA. And so one of the things about losing Lucy Harris recently um, is that all of these things then come out. And I just think that part of my job as someone that spends a lot of time with current and former athletes that are still with us is giving them their flowers while they're still here, acknowledging their effort, their work on and off of the court. And I think the, the tragedy, I think part of my tears, the day that we lost Lucy was about the fact that there were all these people that had no idea of how much she had given the game um, and, and her status as a Hall of Famer, an incredible athlete, incredible activist, community member. And so my job is while we have these folks, um, I want to give them their flowers. I want to interrogate what they offer to the game, what they offer to us that are thinking through feminist thought. Um, because I do think that we have more than just the folks in the academy that are speaking to struggle, resistance, and the ways that we get free. Yeah, no, that's so important. And I think that there, there is, it seems like there's a more contemporary effort to give people their flowers while they are still here. Social media, I think in some ways has afforded those possibilities to be in conversation, but it, I, I share similar frustrations. You know, I'm in, I'm in the process of trying to build out an archive mapping sexual misconduct in the popular music industry. And I'm fully aware that that is a mammoth undertaking, but part of that effort is because so many of these stories happen or are shared posthumously, right? It, they sort of, they happen after the fact, and then it's it's the New York Times doing a very in-depth, beautiful obituary, but in a way that you can no longer be in conversation with, right? Or have the sort of the, 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 the genealogies of the impact of that activism activated in real time in ways that I think um, is, is to sort of our detriment, <laughs> culturally, socially, and, and in detriment to the work, right? And that's not to say that figures like Colin Kaepernick aren't aware of some of these histories, but the way that they are then framed or their activism is then sort of taken up um, into more mainstream conversations and then figures, really important, crucial figures to these histories are lost. Um, so, so thank you for sharing, sharing your process and how you're thinking through this. So this sort of gets me to, to my next question of sort of your own positionality uh, as a woman, as a junior scholar, as, as someone who I know we are, we are often reminded of our identity and how it is read and complicated. 
as we navigate spaces that are both within the academy, outside the academy. Um, one example that I will share with our attendees, um, I had the privilege of, of Courtney joining me in Philadelphia a few weeks back in early March where we were presenting um, on some of our collaborative work at the International Association for Communication and Sport, uh, which this year was um, a day of our presentation was held at the Lincoln Financial Field, home of the Eagles, um, obviously. And we were sort of lost trying to find our way to the conference setting within the Lincoln asked an Eagles uh, employee for directions. Um, and their response was to question whether we were cheerleaders <laughs> attending, uh, coming to the stadium to, for cheerleader tryouts, right? And it was sort of like, well, well, the work is writing itself because we're actually here <laughs> to present on the misrepresentation of gender in sporting spaces, particularly within the NFL. <laughs> so we, these things are, we're actively living through these things as we're reflecting on the work. Um, and so I'm wondering if there, there are other experiences that you have that speak to this. And I'm thinking in particular about, I know some of my students are joining here today, right? Of, of how you navigate, um, how you straddle, move back and forth between these spaces as a woman, as a junior scholar in a space that, that even within academia remains somewhat male dominated. Yeah. I mean, the cheerleader story is just so perfect. It's probably, it's the first and probably last time I'll ever be mistaken for a cheerleader or maybe potential cheerleader. We hadn't made the squad. They were like, are you here for the auditions? <laughs> um, and so for me, I, I, I love these moments. I know that they can be very trying for a lot of folks. I know there's ways that we are often read as students, even in spaces where I have a name badge that says Dr. Cox, <laughs> assistant professor. Um, I've been asked by other colleagues. I've been asked by other women um, uh, if I'm a student, if I am an undergrad or a grad student. And so, you know, I just, I chalk some of that up. I try to laugh it off as like, mm, great skin routine happening today, obviously. Um, but I think the larger kind of dismissal that sometimes happens, especially, you know, I know we'll talk a little bit about the sound of victory of wanting to do public facing work and how historically that's been treated and, and really disregarded in a particular way, even as it can also be held up and valued in the brochure or um, in the university newsletter. There's a way that doing that work is seen as distracting. Acting, um, is not as important. Um, you should publish this journal article that four people will read over um, writing an op-ed or um, doing consulting work with teams or really trying to make the work accessible. Um, I think one of the things that I have found that I have to constantly remind myself of and I constantly return to, and I think we return to this together often, is like, who is this work for? Um, because everything else becomes noise. And so for me, I think a lot about um, not only the folks that have gotten me to this place, the folks that are in my, in my close friend group, in my family, um, the folks that I'm doing work for in terms of that legacy, I think about the athletes and the journalists that, that really um, give me all the information and really educate me very often, I think about how I want that work to reflect them and their voices. And I think about the fact that very early on when I decided to study sport, I knew that was what I knew. I knew I knew that industry. I had those contacts. I knew I wanted to do qualitative work. And then, you know, I later on realized that mixed methods was kind of how I wanted to define myself, in my work. Um, and I think that one of the things that I, I heard often is that I write too journalistically. Um, this idea of there can't be rigor if it's too easy to read, or if I enjoy reading this, maybe it's not rigorous enough, right? It should be a little painful. And I really fight against these narratives because there are so many beautiful writers in academia. There's so many ways that worrying about how I will be read, um, whether it's my identity or my focus in my work, I think I've lost way too many nights sleep on that. And I think one of the things I've had to move forward with, especially after 2016, especially after 2020, is that now it's very popular. Now everyone's like, oh yeah, I always knew we should be studying sports seriously, right? When that had been a really uphill battle for not only me, but for the generations before. So I really sit with that often of like the thing that you love and the passion that you have, you go for it. And then one day it's popular. It's, it's funny that I, I went to Russia to study women's basketball and really study what it was like for U.S. athletes to, to play in other countries. And the, the idea of having to play year round as a WNBA athlete in order um, to really supplement your income. And so, you know, super niche. I think there's many ways my committee um, loved on me and cared for me. Like, oh, you're really just going to become the, the women's basketball person. And then now I'm being asked about, you know, the struggle for women that are playing overseas in Russia. It's a very niche audience. Right. 
But I think going with what I really cared about, which is like the lived experience of these athletes, Mm -hmm. their struggles they had, what it meant to be a black woman in Russia. um, I was really interested in that. And now with, you know, the headlines around Brittany Griner, for example, there are ways that that work is becoming relevant. That is really important in a way that maybe it wasn't six months ago. But I think it helps that I have always cared about what the larger political, social ramifications are for labor and sport. And now it's kind of come full circle. So I guess my my wisdom, I think I would like to impart is like you you go for the thing that that keeps you up at night, the thing that you can't stop thinking about, the thing that you want to you want to be better or you want to know more about. And I think the noise is there. There's no ignoring that it is there. It is awful. Um, but we go inside and we present on gender and we, we have the cheerleader story to take home with us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So this is sort of a perfect segue because one question I get every semester, um, largely from students, but also from from colleagues, from peers, is is the question of of care, both in terms of how you care for yourself when conducting research that can be topically difficult or put you in precarious professional situations like traveling to, to, to Russia, for example, but also care in terms of how you care for your subjects how you care for um, those interlocutors that you are in collaboration with. So I'd love to hear from you a bit about how care functions in your work, in your life as as you're doing this work. Yeah, I mean, I hope you'll also answer that question too, because I think that your work requires a lot of care, both for the folks that that are really the focus of your work, as well as how you care for yourself when you're sitting through all of these documents and you're building this archive that is about harm and violence. Um, and so I, I would also love for you to answer that question too, because I think it's an important one. It, it sustains it's how we continue to the work. It's how we stay whole as people. I think that's really important. Um, for me, I... I have folks that love on me that have no idea what I do for work. They don't care about what I've published. They don't know anything about my CV. And that are my, and it's sometimes it's humbling, right? It's the, the uncle or auntie that's like, are you still in school? <laughs> You're like, I work at a university, right? Um, they're like, you don't, you don't have a job, right? So I think part of it is I am humbled constantly and loved on and cared for uh, by folks that do not care what my output is. I think that's really important. Um, there's ways that we can be talking into as scholars um, to become our work. Um, And I don't think that's necessary. I think our work can be really important um, and we can do the work well, but I don't think that we have to ever become labor. As someone that studies labor, I I highly recommend that we do not. Um, I think the other thing that I've really found is finding other um, outlets for the, my, my inquiry, my discovery, finding other things to, to really be passionate about um, that aren't within that space. And then I guess the last thing would be one of the things that's difficult sometimes when we study something, a lot of us study things we love. You and I both love pop culture. It's the stuff that, we, that both animates our lives, that we are constantly listening and watching things and talking about them. But then when you study it, there's ways that that can become really difficult because you always feel like you're either at work, right? I'm watching sports, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, uh, should I be studying this? What's happening here? What did they, why did they say that that way? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I have to remind myself of is that I started this because I really love sport and I think that we have to make it better. <laughs> um, we have to make it better. We have to make it more inclusive. We have to make, we have to do right by people. And if I didn't love it, I wouldn't care so much if I didn't have an invested interest in making it better. And driving down on campus and seeing people that are just playing sport because they love it. They're organizing themselves. There aren't these other kinds of things going on. Um, there's ways I go to my, my friends, kids games and remind myself of the things that we both have to fight for, but the ways that we love sports. So um, I know you also love going to concerts. Like, I think that like, that's one of the things I think is so great is that you can study music and critique the music industry, but also remind yourself of why music is so important. Um, so how else do you kind of care for yourself and also kind of stick to the work and and still be able to return to it. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for giving me this space. Um, I think it's, I am a work in progress, right? There's different days require different different types of care, different levels of care. And sometimes it means walking away from the work entirely of taking days off from the care. And for those that aren't aren't familiar, most of my work is rooted in, in, in looking at sexual misconduct in the music industry. So it's diving into those stories, diving into those details, sitting, um, sitting with women largely who are who are disclosing these incidents, um, many of whom are doing so decades after, right? So, so paths of recourse are not always available. Accountability is not always available. So, how do you 
do trauma informed research? How do you deal with trauma that's being shared that always also stirs up our own traumas, our own relationships to, to the work? I think part of it is the reminders of that it is coming from a place of love. And I always say I'm, um, I'm an optimist when it comes to this work. And that's not to say that I am delusional um, or not realistic or practical in terms of how much I think may be able to change or in what time span, but it is to say that um, on one hand, I think it's a bit of a survival <laughs> tactic. It's a coping mechanism of, of coming at the work from an optimistic lens, but it is also a belief in, in change as a possibility of saying these are structures, these are systems that are socially constructed, that are enforced, um, that are actively maintained. And as such, there are opportunities, there are cracks um, in these spaces to, 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 to rethink, to reimagine. And so I try to sit in that space, but um, you know, on a very practical level, walks are great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Getting fresh air is great. Stepping away from the work is great. Trying to go to a concert and not think about, are there signs about safety here, right? Are there, are there proper exit zones um, and to sort of get, get lost in it, but it is an, it's an, I'm a work in progress. And I think it is an um, active, negotiation with the work that we do. Um, but I do think that part of it is having community. Part of it is being able to collaborate in particular ways. So I'd love to sort of shift from my last question um, to you before I, I turn to the chat and thank you to those of you I see um, adding questions into the chat for, for Dr. Cox. Um, is this collaboration that we share, The Sound of Victory, um, is something very near and dear to my heart, to your heart, I know. And it's something that we've been developing together over the past five years. So I'm really excited for this opportunity to ask you about it because I feel like so many so many weeks we're sitting in meeting thinking about deadlines or thinking about how to grow the project or to engage with different audiences that I don't get to sit back um, and ask you to reflect on on the larger body of work. So I'd love um, for you to share with with folks today, many of whom may be unfamiliar with this initiative, how this project started, where it is today, um, and what you're excited about for the future of the Sound of Victory. Yeah. So I mean, this goes back to PhD life at USC Edinburgh. And, um, you know, when I, I think one of the things, there's always kind of like this origin story um, that I, I, I think we have to hone in and craft. But one of the things I realized early on is that you were studying music. I was studying sport. We were having a lot of the same questions and we were reading a lot of the same people. And so we could geek out over Stuart Hall together and be thinking through these ideas. And then we're applying it in similar ways to different industries that are both within pop culture. And so I think one of the, the ways that we first started thinking about this at like our very first ICA together was thinking through this idea of doing something that moved beyond the PowerPoint, that moved beyond the, the conference presentation. I think we both had a desire to do things that were more creative. I think that was a huge beginning. And then we both knew that there were all these ways music and sport were starting to align. And so we started this kind of Google Doc that was like, all these different music and sport things. And one of them was the playing of the national anthem before U.S. Sporting, again, sporting events. And one of the things I thought was so great about that, I was like, what do we do with this, right? We could talk about the performances, but there's something that we kind of have to see and feel it, the good, bad, ugly ones. What is this thing that we do here in the States that is seems so necessary? Like we're always kind of forced to do this performance um, of, of nationalism before these games. Um, and then we have all these celebrities that have done this over time across multiple sports. And so um, one of the things we also love in pop culture is thinking about how do we bring these pop culture relics that feel so great for us? Um, how do we bring them into the academic space? So that first thing, um, an ICA um, making and doing presentation was the first space where I was like, oh, we could do a thing. There's a lot that we could do. And so we did these mashups of anthem performances and we did them pop-up video style. If folks remember the MTV VH1 pop-up video um, where it had all these facts and all these different understandings of what was happening during these performances. And so I think us both being invested in performance and cultural studies, um, thinking about that really started with like, well, what else is there? And then we're like, well, there's music videos too. What's up with these music videos that have athletes or these athletes making music videos or skateboarding videos? Um, there were all these different things we started to do. And so that project really 
both became about space and place, about belonging, about media production. Um, and we started to hone in on these sites. Venice is one of them, Venice, California. Um, and thinking about how you have both the music, the live music element of that space. You have the basketball courts, the skateboarding, the skating, roller skating in Venice, this beautiful history, this very important one. And what it means to have this idea of sonic expression or sonic regulation in these spaces. And so we, we really began to expand out and think about what, you know, maybe music scholarship could tell sports scholarship um, or what sound studies could do to inform this work. And so it really became this really eclectic, important mixture of the literature being able to speak to other fields, other places and spaces, the incredible folks that we know are also thinking about these ideas um, and then thinking about how we make this a project that could live outside of the university space. And so it's now evolved to a, a range of different topics. Right now we are focused on the Super Bowl halftime show and really writing a cultural history of, of these annual performances that are watched by hundreds of millions of people. Um, arguably the most watched concert every year is the halftime show. And so now in this phase of the project, it's not only thinking about the multimedia project, it lives as a website, um, as an Instagram account and Twitter account, um, as a podcast, there are all these things. And I think all of my worlds collide in terms of being able to work on this project with you. Um, I myself used to be um, very, very much entrenched in the, in the music world in a very different Different capacities, so it feels like all my whole self can come to this project and thinking about music and sport. Um, and then the other side of it is getting, getting, being able to really hone those creative skills and think about what this would sound like as a podcast, but also what it looks like as a journal article. And so this project has really sustained me in thinking intellectually and creatively um, about where all of these places in pop culture tell us about uh, who we are as a people, where we're going, um, and what it sounds like. Yeah, now um, I, I'm grateful to be able to share this this work with you, this space with you. I'm learning constantly, particularly from the, the sports angle. Um, uh, it's really forced me to rethink how I think about music or, or sound uh, in these sporting spaces. And there's this really, really interesting, rich history that um, I'm excited to continue exploring. The Super Bowl project has been really rich this past year to be able to get to go to Los Angeles and be a part of that work. Um, on the ground. So I have many more questions, um, but I want to turn to the Q&A now. Folks have been dropping in some really wonderful questions. So the first one from Sarah Jackson. Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Sarah says, thanks for this great conversation. I'd love to hear Dr. Cox's thoughts on the current conservative obsession with policing trans athletes, particularly child athletes. It has been uh, correctly understood as a culture war strategy and evokes many ideas about gender from bygone eras. What are the stakes in your mind? Thanks so much, Dr. Jackson. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you for this question. I think one of the things when I talk about studying these issues through sport, I think that this is a fantastic example. When we have all these anti-trans policies that are coming up in various states and thinking about what this legislation means in this particular moment, it's not a coincidence that it's being funneled through sport. Right. Um, and so it's it's not only the relationship of all of this, land, this very, very not even coded language. Right. That is not only about being transphobic, but it's about children. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Right. It's about youth sports. So in the same way I, I said before, like there's there's something that is very freeing about um, kids getting to learn to play and learn together. There's something about what that means when we deprive folks from that space, when we exclude them all together. And there's many different ways exclusion happens. But I think in this moment, I'm particularly attuned to these policies having a sport rhetoric and the language of we have to protect girls and women. This idea of girls and women need to be protected um, from trans athletes. And, and when I say that, it's it's very specific, the difference between how trans girls and women are treated versus trans boys and men are treated within sport and outside of it. And this threat has a sexist lens of both this idea that um, girls and women need protecting. And I think there's many ways that that young um, and professional athletes need protecting from abuse of power, for example. Um, they need protecting from these various structures that are racist and sexist and homophobic. Um, there's all of these various things that we can talk about in terms of protection, in terms of protecting the health and safety of athletes around the world. I do not think that that trans athletes are in the top 
a hundred issues that I would bring to the space. And so it's interesting, these folks that have never been invested in girls or women's sports suddenly entering the space and saying that um, that trans athletes are dangerous, are going to ruin sport, are going to take away. I've seen Title IX weaponized recently um, and in this anniversary of Title IX as being like, th this will take away everything that, that girls and women have fought for. And the things that I think about often, especially when I think about, um, I'll even take it to like college swimming right now and thinking about this, the outrage that I see online, the transphobic language I see, even in folks that are um, within these swimming media spaces, um, is that there's no attention to, there's attention on one athlete, not on the 24 records that were broken at that tournament. Not the fact that um, there's an idea um, I think about, and it comes from Sean Crincoli um, and this legal scholar's idea, like you can only participate if you can't win. And it was thinking specifically about Castor Semenya and Oscar Pistorius and thinking about what was happening with those two South African athletes in terms of their fight to be able to compete. But I think there's this very similar logic that happens with trans athletes of you can be included, but if you win too much, we will say you have an unfair advantage. Even as now, all the policies that have informed the IOC, for example, um, have been retracted. A lot of the ways that testosterone, for example, um, has been, you know, used and legislated in a particular way of like being the potential harm or um, the idea of that's an unfair advantage. All those things have been rolled back as of late, very quietly so retracted from journals. And so for me, there are there are two landscapes. One is about the ability to live and be a whole person in the world. That's most important. And sport is one way that we do that. And so it's not, to me, it is um, alarming that especially at the youth sport level, this is happening because that is the first space where we might feel most open to engage in sport, right? There are all these ways that become specialized um, and, and has these other boundaries, but that is so important to the fabric of who we become socially. We are our man, the player, right? And so I think if we think about ourselves in the way that play um, and storytelling and narrative are ways that we, we are human and people, I think there's a huge, huge thing that's happening right now that is terrifying to me. Um, this idea of not being able to say gay, the idea of not allowing trans athletes to compete. These are massive ramifications that start with something like sport, but they have this ripple effect. Sport and education and the relationship between the two of them inform these major pillars of our society. And so um, I do not think it's a coincidence that this is where it's starting. I think we have to be attuned and really vigilant um, about that. And I think there's something about this idea of um, visibility, and there's a lot of ways we can think about visibility versus what it means to be read as hyper visible, right? And so I think one of the the things that I'm really sitting with now is like, how do we as allies, as scholars, as folks that are invested in the future of sport, the future of humanity, how do we push back against this? And this, this is different um, when we're talking about this from a, a political standpoint, I think, versus the cultural one of these spaces and the language behind them. And so I've been engaging with a lot of conversations with folks, but I also have been really listening um, to a lot of um, trans journalists, athletes, other folks that have been really helping me think through this and, and growing my work. And my work has expanded. I, I started, you know, I, I always say I studied Black women and non-binary athletes in this project. But it was not until I had athletes that were identifying as non-binary or as trans that really animated and impacted my work. And so I'm constantly expanding the way I think about how we, we smash this idea of a gender binary in many ways. And so I really appreciate this question because I think it's every day we're seeing more and more of this vitriol, this language that's coming out. And I think we have to be we have to fight it on like five different fronts at this point. Yeah, really, really important. Um, thank you for that question, Sarah. Um, next question is from Dr. Barbie Zelitzer. Barbie, thank you for being here. Barbie says, thanks for the super informative conversation. I wonder if you could speak more about the obstacles in the academy that minimize scholarly work on either music or sport as being not as quote unquote important as other areas and how gender plays into that assessment. Uh, it's great that an event like Brittany Griner gets fo folks focusing, but how is it possible to extend the lifeline of that focus beyond individuals who are invested in the areas to begin with? Yeah, that's a huge, really important question. I think one of the things that one of the obstacles that has happened is, is definitely the minimization, right? Why are we worried about this when we could be worrying about these, these other things, right? And I think the example that Sarah gave about um, thinking about how this has moved towards legislation or how Brittany Griner's situation 
could become this larger matter of international diplomacy and has become so in many ways behind closed doors. I think our examples, right, that people say, OK, well, that that thing is important. Um, and my job is really, especially when I, I'm asked to speak publicly about these things for various media outlets, is to say, well, the larger question is, you know, everyone will say something like, um, well, if it was Tom Brady, it would be so much more, there would be so much more media coverage. And I'm like, well, it will never be Tom Brady because the actual structures at hand require Brittany Griner to go play in Russia. And so I want to start from that question. I want to move beyond this one person who I care about very much. And I think a lot of folks are invested in terms of getting um, Griner home safely. But I think one of the things that, that I'm more invested in is what are the various mechanisms that require this to happen and that, that lead to this happening in the first place? And so that's one way that I try to expand and try to think past like these folks that are like, this isn't important or sports are frivolous, right? Um, there were a lot of times very early on where folks were interested in sport or had ideas or wanted to, to think through ideas or, or headlines that they were seeing. And they were kind of whispered to me, like, I know it's not cool to, <laughs> to talk about sports seriously, but I, I'm wondering what you think about X, Y, Z. And so I've just tried to make those things louder um, in terms of thinking about those ramifications that move beyond one, one athlete, one person, one moment to the structures and these longer legacies of how we can connect them to other folks, other communities and other struggles that are happening at the same time. And so, again, I think, um, you know, I think music has maybe a slightly different history. And if you want to talk about that, I, I would love to hear you talk about that. I think sport and this idea of play um, has this different ramification that it's classed in many ways. If we go back to kind of the um, leisure as a space for certain types of folks of a certain class. Um, and I think that that relationship is different. Um, and so one of the things I always start with in terms of the investment is I'll say something like someone may not know anyone on their city council. They may not know who the mayor of their city is, but they know someone that's on the practice squad of their NFL team. And that matters because that's where we meet people and we have these conversations. We can slide in some vegetables with the dessert um, because we're starting from where people actually are. And so I find that the pushback I get within the academic spaces are actually not happening when I talk with students because that's what they know. And that's where we can have these larger conversations conversations about transphobia or racism or class, right? Somehow they're like, oh, I hadn't really been talking about a class critique, but now I'm in this space. And so I think that's what I rely on. And I think the, the trendiness of studying certain forms of popular culture are not things we have. The ebbs and flows are not what we have to worry about. We just have to do the work. Um, but I have found in recent years, it's gotten a lot easier. Again, since Missouri football stand, um, since Colin Kaepernick, especially, um, I think it's been a lot easier than, than I think it's been before that and for scholars that have come before me. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll hold my thoughts because I think there's a great question that, that is a perfect segue uh, from Barbie's questions and the, and the comments that, that you just shared. Um, and this is from Carrie Tipton. And Carrie asks, um, I teach a lot of athletes and other students interested in the intersection of sports, creative culture, arts, et cetera. I'm curious if you think there's a path for universities to mentor students in possible career paths in the world of sports media production, broadcasting, et cetera. The sense I get is that lots of students are so interested but aren't aware of how you get started in that kind of industry unless they're journalism majors. Um, so she would, uh, the, Carrie would love for you to, to speak to that a bit. Yeah, oh, Dr. Tipton, thank you so much. This is so great. Thank you for being here. One of the things that I would say, um, I feel like I do mentorship kind of one-on-one -on -one for folks that realize I used to work at ESPN or um, in, at an NPR affiliate and they're interested. Um, I think one of the big things that I see that there is an opportunity for um, for all of us to consider is the range of roles that are possible that most students are not even aware of, right? So there's idea of like, there's someone in front of the camera, there's someone that's holding the camera. And I'm like, there are so many other people that are involved and there's so many majors. Um, when you work somewhere like ESPN, there are a ton of history majors that work at ESPN um, in front of and behind the camera. There are folks that are working, getting degrees in English. There are folks that are, are getting all types of degrees, engineering degrees. There's a space for you in these places. And so um, one of the things that I, I am reminded of is that 
part of my job is to let folks know um, those possibilities. When I explain what I used to do, working first as a production assistant, but even um, moving on to being an associate director and working in live trucks and control rooms, is explaining that space as a really exciting, dynamic adrenaline rush of doing live television that a lot of folks may not realize if you are well, if you have organizational skills, you can be great. If you are great at spell check, uh, you can be a graphics producer. There are all these different um, opportunities. And I think both within journalism and outside of it, because I do appreciate the question of like, it's not just journalism majors that make television um, or that work at, at an NPR um, type station. And so I think one of the things we have to do is start to let folks know the opportunities of if you write well, there's so many opportunities for you in sport, whether you're on the PR side, um, whether you're helping um, a social media side, there's so many things, whether you're a business major, there's a ton of things that are happening, especially in this new social media landscape we find ourselves in. And so one of the things that I think we have to do a better job of is maneuvering students into their ideal space, whether it's an internship, a job, what have you. Um, and letting them know there's so many opportunities. I think that folks only see the names that are printed, only see the names that are fonted on television and think, well, if I'm not an athlete, a coach, um, a sideline reporter or, or a journalist, there's no other space for me. And so I think that there's a, a need to maybe center some of that, maybe bringing more industry professionals in that aren't people that have the bylines. Um, understanding that editors are really important to the work that we do with it. They're editors for broadcast um, or for print or for online. And so I think that's one of the, the bridges we have to connect to industry for folks that, that do want to enter this space is connecting them with folks that are directors um, or producers of television, for example. And so I think that's one of the big, the big things I think I would like to do in the future as well is, is just in a more formalized capacity, um, helping them understand that there's a lot of different paths and we needed a lot of different types of folks. And then on the other side, the, the structural things, asking folks to, to work long hours unpaid, um, already classes who can move into sport arenas, right? Who can work in these spaces? So the other side of it is partnering with these industry people and knowing that for a lot of folks, an unpaid internship is not possible because we have to work other jobs to support our families and support ourselves. So I was very lucky to have paid internships that really helped me. Um, and I really think that we have to push industry to, to make sure it's an inclusive environment for folks across um, a variety of identities. Yeah, really important. And I'll just add one of the joys of growing the sound of victory over the past few years is the ability to have students um, uh, helping and being compensated, whether it's through through credit or through work study or student work positions that are that are doing this work to sort of get hands on as much as we we can enable through um, through the research uh, or the social media or the creative production side of things um, and so we're working with three Penn Penn undergraduates this semester which has been a real a real joy um, uh, I'd love to go next to this a question from Maria Fernanda who asks if you could please talk about your own early influences on your creative practice. Mm -hmm. For example, who do you remember reading or whose work you first fell in love with? I adore this question. Thank you so much. Um, early influences. Um, I will say from a, a media perspective, I will say that Robin Roberts was like the first first woman I think I really was like, wow, like this, this is how you interview. This is how you really engage with people. I felt like early sports center. Um, I didn't grow up with cable at home. And so like watching sports center was a luxury on vacations in a hotel. <laughs> it was like this very fantastic thing. And so I think Robin Roberts was one of the first early models of like just dynamic interviewer, um, fantastic personality um, from that perspective uh, of getting, uh, of thinking that there might be a space for me in sport. Um, I think in terms of reading um, one of the early I think I love reading people's life stories. I love memoir and there are a lot of great sport memoirs. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I think for me, coming to cultural studies, having more of a, a social science -y program in terms of journalism, there's a lot of surveys, a lot of political communication kind of style work that happens. And so finding cultural studies was really, really important for me. And then finding, I think, um, I mentioned Stuart Hall before, but I think for me, like the first thing, you know, I think I, I stumbled on was like encoding, decoding. But I think from there, I really moved on to thinking about like, what does it mean for culture to be ordinary? Like, what do these things mean? So I think cultural studies scholars in particular really um, brought me into a space um, 
I think Sarah Benet Weiser's hoop dreams made me think that studying women's basketball was possible. That's one article I return to, I feel like every couple of months. Um, and then outside of that, I think um, Bell Hook's work has inspired me in terms of how I want to write and how I want to move through the world. All About Love is probably one of my favorite books of all time. And so thinking about, um, we talked about care earlier, um, thinking about the various ways that um, that care comes through it in a lot of the things that I read, I think is a huge part of it. Um, I think those are the main folks that I can say like early grad school. Um, I think outside of that, um, I'm slowly returning to to fiction now. And I feel like fiction is kind of where I first started. Um, I used to, I, I've been a nerd for a long time. Um, it's a lifelong commitment. And as a kid, I would volunteer at the public library in the summers. And one summer I read every Toni Morrison book and I, I have no kind of uh, fantasy of ever sounding like Toni Morrison, but I think one of the things that helps me think about this now as an academic, there's a lot of ways we are disciplined to become bad writers <laughs> you know, within academia. And I think fiction and, and Toni Morrison being one of them, of fully immersing myself in someone's work, I think was really, really important to me. And so um, I, I constantly return back. Um, I, I started reading Song of Solomon again recently, and it took me back to that summer, but it also reminded me that we can write deeply and beautifully um, in, in, in many ways that if, I think musically a lot about her work, like her, there's something musical um, to Toni Morrison's work to me. And so I'm constantly brought back to those spaces. Um, and then finally, I'll say Perry put me onto Greg Tate and um, Greg Tate's work, his criticism, I think, in many ways, and in even watching his live talks when he's meeting and talking and in community with scholars, reminds me of, of influences on my creative practice, um, as well as how I wanna engage with folks in community and, and whether they're visual artists, whether they're music artists, whether they're athletic artists, um, thinking about that. And so I would say like, those are my big, big influences on creative practice, um, as well as the folks that I read that keep me sane and remind me to, to write better, write clearer, write beautifully if I can. Um, thank you. I think that's a really beautiful place to end today. Um, wrap up a few minutes early Friday afternoon. This has been such a joy, a really important and instructive conversation. I know I have learned so much from you today. I continue to learn from you um, and believe I can speak on behalf of our virtual community here and thanking you, Dr. Courtney M. Cox, for your time, your insight, um, and your continued investment in this work, your continued investment in your studi and your student and pushing the boundaries um, of what academic work um, can be, can do. Um, I've dropped links to The Sound of Victory, to Dr. Cox's website, um, into the chat function. They are linked there. Um, is there anywhere else that I should be pointing folks to to support you, your work? Um, for those that will be at ICA, please come up and say hello, introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, uh, we will be there, um, but I just want to extend my gratitude to you again and to thank everyone else for being here today, for joining us. I look forward to meeting those of you who I have not yet had the chance to meet, um, and I hope that everyone has a really, really beautiful weekend. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, y'all.